Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cave of the Cross Projects. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tony. And we have uh, the privilege of <coughs> sitting here uh, today uh, to interview one of our uh, um, uh, authors that we just uh, read uh, the book, Truth in a Culture of Doubt. Yeah. And uh, for some odd reason, he agreed to <laughs> come on to our little show and talk to us about it, which is uh, a huge get and also just uh, a, a giant pleasure for both of us because uh, this man's uh, prolific and gracious. I say prolific because he's the author of around 50 books and gracious because he's taking time out on his to sabbatical on show. I, to come onto our show. On his sabbatical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Andreas Kostenberger, the, yeah. the, the, the person who I have the most amount of books in my library on. Uh, he's the research professor of New Testament and Biblical Theology and director of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is also the founder of uh, Biblical Foundations, an organization devoted to encouraging a return to biblical foundations in the home, the church, and society. And he is, of course, one of our authors, along with Daryl Bach and Josh Chetra, Truth and Culture of Doubt, Engaging Skeptical Challenge to the Book, or to the Bible, which responds to the claims of Bartman against the New Testament yeah. and other claims of, that Bart right. likes to bring in. Yeah. Sometimes he's a theologian. Sometimes he just wants to be a member of uh, the, the Parliament of, of Theology. So, Dr. Kostenberger, welcome to the show. Again, thank you very much. Oh, it's, uh, I'm thrilled to be with you, Patrick. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Great. Um, I have to start right off the bat. You have written on everything, absolutely everything I, I could possibly think of. A uh, book on women, it's there. A book on apologetics, it's there. A book on John, which is, uh, I think might be one of your favorites. How do you mm -hmm. write so much and not be 300 years old? A Methuselah-type uh, <laughs> time span. Are you Methuselah? That's, what, that's my first question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I've always had multiple interests. And, um, you know, I get bored if I just, you know, work on the same subject for too long. Uh, same with my teaching. I, I'd like to mix things up and to, you know, teach different courses. And um, I guess in terms of writing, I, I uh, you know, not that not many people know that, but I uh, studied uh, concert piano when I was uh, in in middle school and high school. Uh, and uh, so I went to the Vienna uh, Academy of, of Music and Fine Arts, and I would practice the piano for like two to three hours in the afternoon. Well, my friends were just kind of goofing off, not, you know, uh, in the afternoon. So I was, um, I developed a, uh, the, you know, a discipline of, of kind of rigorous uh, practice. And that's actually, I think, served me well. I don't play the piano nearly as much anymore now, uh, but I feel like I've kind of transferred, you know, some of the, the routines to writing. And uh, I think uh, I, I love even studying the habits of writers. I've read books about, you know, uh, how other people write routines. I, I just recently uh, had the a thrill of standing in the room where Ernest Hemingway down at, uh, at Key West mm -hmm. uh, wrote some of his works, I think in the, you know, 1930s. And uh, I, I'm just intrigued by how, how writers uh, go about, you know, uh, their work because it's so highly creative. And so you, you just really have to be in, in, the, in some sort of a groove. Um, and um, at the same time, you know, you do need discipline. Uh, you know, people sometimes don't realize even just writing one book, it is a ton of work. Yeah. And so you right. need both uh, creativity and you also need discipline. It's just, it's just kind of a, you know, a bit of a tricky combination, but I think God's equipped me with, with a certain amount of creativity. I come from a very music, musical family. My, my sister is actually violinist for the Vienna Symphony. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we, we got that kind of in our, in our genes and uh, the kind of the creative gene, you know, and then also I have a German mother uh, who uh, is very That's industrious right? and, uh, <laughs> and very disciplined. So yeah. I, you know, hey, uh, blame it on my genes. <laughs> so, well, you, you notice, I've, I've noticed that uh, several of your books are written with other people. So, yeah. uh is that uh, intentional or, you know, why, why, you know, what's, what's going on there? Hey, that's a great question. Very perceptive too. I think there's a couple things going on. Uh, one is I have a very healthy respect for, uh, you know, my limitations, uh, you know, what, what I've been trained in and also what, what I haven't been trained in. And uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because 
we might come back to that later when we talk about the the multiple uh, fields that that Bart Ehrman is 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 writing on. Not all of which I might add. Uh, you know, he's actually formally trained in. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to stay away from uh, writing for publication uh, in areas that I really have no training in. So I'd rather, you know, find a collaborator. Uh, the other thing is that I sometimes like to work with with really bright, promising students of mine. Uh, it, it, it's a win-win because they typically have a little more time uh, and energy and uh, at the same time, you know, I, I can kind of mentor them. It's, you know, and maybe even give them a start in writing. And I think this book is a good example because uh, Josh Satro was one of my students, uh, did his uh, PhD work under me mm-hmm. and is, is just a brilliant young man. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a joy to work with him. And of, of course, with uh, Daryl Bach, who's kind of the senior scholar. Great. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so you're, you're more Einstein, you know, Einstein, uh, 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 had these big <laughs> prolific things, but then went out on a sailboat and played the violin. So from a German background too. So <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Understand. Um, you recently published a book, uh, signs of the Messiah an introduction to John's gospel. It seems like you do like, uh, the gospel of John or, or, or maybe John, uh, the, the person, uh, is one of your favorite subjects to write on. Can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, what, what draws you to him? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, John was probably the the person closest to uh, Jesus uh, during his earthly ministry. And so I find him to be just incredibly profound and yet, you know, very simple in his language, but that's kind of deceptive because uh, there's just a lot to ponder. Uh, It's interesting. You would actually mention that topic because uh, it's very apologetic. I, you know, there I I focus on the seven signs and they're really given as evidence for uh, Jesus, uh, claim uh, to be the Messiah and, and, and really puts the burden on people, you know, to, to, um, to grapple with, with the evidence and to basically uh, essentially put the burden on them. You know, uh, Jesus uh, did all the, the works that were expected of the Messiah. And, and so you see the signs, he, he, uh, he heals uh, an invalid. He opens the eyes of a, of a blind man. He even raises the dead. And so, uh, you know, if it, if, if someone did all those, those works, I mean, on what basis are, are you rejecting, you know, the evidence? So I uh, really, uh, the book is, is essentially, you know, in the genre of apologetics as well. It, it seems like we go back to Lewis's question, Lord, lunatic or liar, uh, in, in there again. Um, yeah. in fact, our, our pastor, where we're going through these, uh, seven IM statements in John and, and working yeah. our way through John. So, uh, when, when your book got released, I of course picked it up uh, right away, but, uh, I was like, Hey, this, this, uh, looks uh, familiar. So you're, you're in yeah. good company there. Um, so, uh, let, let's get uh, uh, back to you. Cause, uh, um, I, 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 like I said, I, I just, I just love the breadth of your work, the scope of your work, uh, highs, lows, you working with your, with your wife, who's also a, uh, a, a, a doctor as well. Um, you were born in yeah. uh, Vienna, Austria, and, uh, you received mm-hmm. a master's and uh, doctorate in, uh, social and economic science. So kind of a, a, a stone's throw away from theology. And uh, you did that at uh, uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business. Can you talk about yeah. uh, kind of your transformation from economist to theologian there? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I became a Christian during uh, my years at the university uh, there in Vienna. Um, uh, I grew up nominal Roman Catholic. Um, and uh, as a student, actually, I was very much attracted to existentialism uh, because I, I found existentialism to be more uh radical than other philosophies you know if there's no god then then we're thrown into an ultimately uh, meaningless existence and and so our existence really is absurd and and that's what existentialists believe and and at the time i thought he was more honest and more rigorous intellectually than to pretend there's a meaning to life when there really isn't or uh, to make up some meaning that is merely subjectively defined and and doesn't objectively exist in reality does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we recently read um, uh, Nancy Piercy's Finding Truth, and she talks about kind of those claims of, of how I became an atheist yeah. in college, uh, uh, re- responding yeah. to people that, that have that. So, yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I became a Christian, needless to say, my thinking changed radically. I, 
I, I think for me, it started with somehow, uh, you know, developing a, a strong conviction that one day I would have to give an account to God for the life I lived and the, the choices I made. I, I can't even explain how I arrived at that point, but it, 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 you know, so it, for me, it really started with uh, the prospect, the likely prospect of, 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 you know, God's judgment. And um, I, I realized at that point, I was very poorly equipped to face my creator. Um, and I, I, I did realize that um, I was sinful, I, which it took a little while, honestly, I, uh, growing up Roman Catholic, it was, it's just my understanding of, 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 of human sinfulness was, was, was very kind of blurry. Um, because I think in the Roman Catholic church often their view of, of, of human depravity is, is, is a little bit fuzzy. It's a bit of a mix of good and evil, a little bit like in, in Jewish, uh, thought as well. Uh, but, um, I, I gradually came to realize that I desperately needed what, uh, Christ had to offer, um, uh, uh, forgiveness of sins, uh, something that's not available anywhere else, you know? And so I, I think I was, I was realistic enough to realize that, that I had to basically just, uh, not sacrifice my intellect, but just humble myself and admit to God that I, I just couldn't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And that's still for a proud person. That's still a hard thing to do. Um, but I just, you know, it was as simple as acknowledging my sinfulness and my need for a savior, thanking uh, Jesus for dying on the cross for my sins. And, uh, and it was like a couple weeks after that, I went to church and it was almost like some sort of a, a tangible relief I felt like a huge burden was taken off my shoulders and I didn't have to bear the burden of my sin anymore. You know, Jesus had done that for me. It was just such an incredible relief mm. and liberation, uh, not to have to bear my, you know, the burden of my own sin anymore. And so, you know, my existentialist days were over <laughs> and I, I found myself on my road to my own road to Damascus. It was a pretty radical, uh, you know, conversion experience. And so I asked God, you know, what do you want me to do with my life? And uh, I soon found myself on the way to study theology, uh, first at seminary and then uh, for a P PhD. I still remember uh, going to some Bible studies and it was incredibly humiliating because here I was, right? I almost had my PhD at that point in economics and, and there were some elderly ladies and, you know, they would flip back and forth and they knew where <laughs> Philippians was and, and where first Samuel was. And I was just kind of looking around. I was totally lost. I, uh -huh. in my 23 years, I'd never once opened the Bible. And so I felt like I had a lot to catch up on at that point. But, you know, I had the intellectual curiosity at that point and the, and the, the spiritual hunger to, um, to just search the scriptures and, and studying with, with, with uh, Don Carson was just a treat. You know, uh, Trinity, uh, Evangelical Divinity School. Um, and he was actually the one who encouraged me to work with university students and to engage in student ministry. And so I, I did some over the years, but uh, it really wasn't until my children uh, approached college age. We have four children, um, two girls and two boys, uh, that I really sensed a, a growing urgency to address apologetics topics, especially uh, in interaction with, uh, with Bart Ehrman, um, you know, I, I attended a debate that he and, uh, and Dan Wallace of, uh, you know, professor at Dallas seminary, uh, had on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill, mm. uh, just before my oldest daughter enrolled there as a freshman. Wow. <laughs> and so it was kind of like, it, it got a little bit personal, right? Because we, yeah. we only live about 45 minutes away uh, from Chapel Hill. And what struck me in that debate, which I live tweeted, by the way, I mean, it's fascinating, is that while Dan Wallace had most of the evidence on his side, I believe, uh, somehow Bart Ehrman, with his charismatic style and his home field advantage there at UNC, managed to looked like he had won the debate. Wow. Wow. 
And I realized that, you know, the truth doesn't always win out and debates are not always the best way to settle a given issue. So uh, the idea for truth and the culture of doubt was born. And uh, also the, you know, the more popular version truth matters uh, where we, we try to methodically dismantle Ehrman's arguments one at a time, as you know, and, on topics such as suffering, problem of evil, alleged contradictions in the Bible, uh, alleged corruption of, of scripture, problems of in the transmission of the text, historicity of Jesus' resurrection. I mean, all the key topics uh, for the faith. And uh, uh, we even, as, as I think you realize, have a uh, kind of a short question and answer guide for people who might find themselves confronted with some of his his quick talking points, you yeah. know, that, that yeah. remain pretty constant on, on the different shows where he gives interviews, you know, and, and some of them are very persuasive, like on the surface and it, it throws people for a loop at first. And so we really wrote that not for fellow academics, but, but just to equip college students, you know, what do I do when I find myself in religion 101 or new Testament survey, you know, with Bart Ehrman. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's there's an idea out there that uh, that we just have these kind of four books uh, that, that no one knows who wrote them. Uh, they all contradict each other. Um, you know, there, there's some mysterious Q document if 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 you can even uh, get back to there. And uh, it, it's it seems like Byerman has has kind of popularized, uh, and we'll get a little bit more into it the the Bauer yeah. hypothesis and 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 kind yeah. of made it. Uh, uh, popular or, or, or um, uh, 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 people seem to enjoy it. And it seems like uh, he found the perfect niche in between uh, kind of the, the new atheism movement and then uh, people kind of growing out of that and saying, oh, look, uh, uh, us skeptics yeah. uh, don't have to just say, uh, you know, oh, I don't believe, uh, you know, there, there's uh, responses that we can give to, to, the, uh, to, to the Christians that, that uh, they mm-hmm. hold this this book up and it seems to, to shatter before them under the weight of ermine and uh, that, that seems to be um, quite uh, at, at least uh, started to be dismantled uh, within your book uh, obviously there's he, he wrote books on it you wrote chapters on his books almost and and uh, and and yeah that's right. we, we, we yeah. see that there's uh, definitely a lot more to, to say there so you're you're saying that the, basically the idea for this book and the other the uh, truth matters book, came out mm-hmm. as a result of, of that debate situation. Exactly. I actually uh, talked to some students there afterwards because mm-hmm. I was curious yeah. and, you know, how it came across to them. I, I know how it came across to me, but, you know, I'm a seminary professor, so I was really more interested in were they swayed by his charisma and, you know, by, by some of the salesmanship, if you will. Yeah. And uh, one I talked to one girl there. I went with, with, with one of my students. And so the two of us almost did kind of a little survey there at the door. You know, what do you, what do you think kind of thing? And the, the one girl, it really struck me what she said. She said, you know, I, I come from a Christian home and I, I, I feel like I, I want to still hang on to my faith. So even if the Bible isn't true or isn't totally true, wow. I, I, I think I still can believe in Jesus. <laughs> wow wow you know and it, it just kind of struck me i mean we don't want to lose people like that you know right, right. Uh, right. because he's undermining their confidence he's kind of the apostle of doubt if you will you know mm-hmm. and so the title truth in the culture of doubt yeah um w- one of the topics that uh, we uh, you kind of st- start out the book with is uh, this uh, problem of evil and uh, and bible mm-hmm. contradictions as well um, do you find it odd that uh, skeptics like Ehrman and uh, kind of tend to focus on this subject? It, it, it seems like um, it's such a such a far reach. Or you know, are we still are are, are people still banking on this uh, kind of uh, according to them kind of antiquated idea of uh, you know there there's evil in the world, but we just kind of call it whatever we don't mm-hmm. like. It seems like a, a, yeah. a weird thing for him to focus on for him being. Uh, kind of uh, um, so scholarly in in, in yeah. his other yeah. subjects. Yeah, you know, it was kind of interesting uh, even deciding which chapters to include in the book and which topics to address and even in which order. Uh, and uh, in the end, that was not our initial plan, but in the end, we decided to front it 
with the problem of evil and then why does God allow suffering? Because uh, even though it's a little more advanced topic and it's, it's really more complex than some of the other issues we're dealing with, uh, it seemed like that was really the foundational issue, at least for him. And in my experience also for quite a few other people that I've, you know, I've, so uh, I would sometimes be asked to speak on this topic at university uh, campuses. And I usually ask my host, you know, so I uh, can't talk about probably everything in the book. You know, what do you want me to talk about? And and I would say the vast majority of times they want me to talk about the problem of suffering. Is that right? Wow. Uh, and, you know, I d- d- to your question, I, I do find it odd. You know, I don't want to get off track by talking too much of about Bart Ehrman, but his field of expertise is text criticism. Right. That's what his first book was on. Uh, you know, the Orthodox uh, corruption of scripture. He studied with the uh, renowned text critic, Bruce Metzger at, at Princeton. Uh, and in, 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 and yet in many of his writings, he makes it sound like his main problem is related to the text of the Bible. You know, the, the text of the Bible is corrupt. There's, there's contradictions, which is more a field of, of harmonization or even biblical theology. Uh, but then it's very clear in, in his book on suffering that his real problem is with God allowing human suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, it, it almost makes some of his other work like Jesus interrupted and so forth, uh, disingenuous looking because, you know, there he talks about things that by his own admission are not even really the reason why ultimately he rejects uh, the God of the Bible uh, as an agnostic. Uh, And, you know, as far as I know, he has little uh, formal expertise in, in that area, because that's a matter of, you know, theology, a matter of philosophy. Mm-hmm. And as far as I know, he's a rank amateur in those fields. I mean, he's even honestly a rank amateur in biblical theology when he, so when he talks about, um, you know, alleged contradictions in scripture, he's really out of his depth as far as I'm concerned as a trained uh, text critic. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do feel like it'd be wise for him to, um, to read up, honestly, on, on some of those fields at the very least. When you look at his footnotes, they're often very sparse. And I, I remember looking at the Jesus Interrupted book, very few footnotes, and I think almost half of them are to his own work. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. <laughs> Which shows you how kind of self-referential he is and, and feels that I know something about, you know, he would not even show any awareness of the existence of some key works, like in this case, Richard Bauckham's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Right. You know, he yeah. doesn't refer to that book a single time in Jesus Interrupted, when obviously – you know, that's a key contribution in the field. So that's not very scholarly. Yeah. It, it, it does seem like uh, him replying to specific claims rather than kind of the general uh, knowledge claims of, of, oh, well, we know John wrote John. Well, you know, can, can you can you talk about that? Can you talk about uh, Papias and, and, and the like? Uh, it, it seems sparse there. And to, to your point, I think uh, going th- uh, through your book and seeing how many times he, he does play this this kind of theologian of like, OK, so God, uh, we know that the Bible's not written, uh, you know, by God's inspiration because, uh, it, you know, th- there's these 400,000 changes or whatever number we're up to. But it mm-hmm. seems like then you have to assume something about a God that you don't believe in, that you don't think that the that even um, uh, that that we've misconstrued, that we've 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 uh, we've had a false sense of who Jesus is or what he's saying or or what could possibly be said. And it seems like you're you're going around along as John and you're writing, uh, you know, in the beginning and and you you mess up the word beginning and it's almost God has to take your hand and erase it and say, no, 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 that's not what I said. Come on, come, come yeah. with me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and again, I mean, those of us, right, who who are have tried to witness to, uh, you know, unbeliever, I mean, part of what you try to find out is what the real issue is, you know, that they're they're struggling with, and uh, and then let's talk about that, <laughs> uh, not about some, you know, smoke screen that. Even if I gave you an answer, uh, it's still not going to ultimately change your mind. Right. And I think in his case, you know, I feel like in those debates, he's, he's debating Dan Wallace, for example, on on text critical issues, you know, uh, 
uh, when all the while his real problem is over here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think sometimes it can be frustrating because I think people don't realize in those debates, there's actually debate rules. And so they're imposed on you. You can't just talk about certain things because you're not supposed to. Right. Uh, right. And so if the debate is supposed to be a text criticism, you got to stick to text criticism, yeah. which is one reason why I would usually not agree to those kinds of debates because I need to be free <laughs> like a laser to focus in on what, what I think the key issue is. Yeah. yeah. I, I think back to uh, uh, one of my favorite debates uh, with him is the one with James White and I'm part, par partial to James White. So that, that helps too. Um, where, yeah. where uh, the, the main topic is what, what uh, in, in any of the new Testament documents, do you see a, a change that would result in a change of theology or, 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 or claim? Yeah. And he points to a, a, a passage in Hebrews that uh, Dr. White <laughs> walks through and it's, just well there's there's no issue here and you know he he's, no. he's he, he tries to hang his hat like that that's your <laughs> that's that's your biggest thing is is exactly is this this one change in in hebrews and and of course i'll link to the to the debate again that we we uh, talked about in going over your book as well and seems like well e yeah. even in his interviews you know he'll he'll on one hand talk in the book of, of the you know four hundred thousand changes and and but he won't codify that when he goes to an interview and says, oh, well, what do you think the Bible really said back then? And he was like, well, pretty much just says what it says now. And then uh, uh, kind of towards your yeah. other uh, other end of the chapter, well, uh, it, Jesus never existed. And he'll even say, well, of course he existed. Where, where do we go to? The text of the New Testament is the best source. <laughs> so, you know, which yeah. is it? <laughs> Well, and sometimes there's two audiences, you know, I think he's generally more careful when he knows he's talking to other scholars because uh, he knows enough mm. about, uh, you know, what, what scholarship uh, says. And so he has to, he can't be too simplistic, but most of the time he has a much easier day when he talks to, you know, a popular audience. And there he sometimes makes very unguarded, uh, really irresponsible uh, claims that, uh, you know, I think deep down inside, he needs to know that he really can't defend those claims or he, he would never get away with it in a scholarly debate, you know, but, but then again, uh, the millions of people who have, you know, bought his book, whether or not they, they read them all, uh, the, you know, sometimes they're, they're unsuspecting victims. I mean, you just think about really preying on freshman students, at UNC Chapel Hill, you know, who are not religion majors, right? Uh, who, uh, I mean, they're an easy target. Uh, it's almost unfair to think about, right? That, that you know, how unequally they're matched with somebody like this who who knows just exactly which buttons to push to to get a certain reaction. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's, it's very um, I think dangerous. And and he's a false teacher. And so I think as a result, you know, I feel like as a father, as a you know, even apart from scholarship now, you know, a, a responsibility to, to protect unsuspecting, uh, you know, teenagers uh, who, who enroll in his classes and who have no idea that he has a, a kind of this, this agenda to basically um, uh, challenge their faith to the point of basically uh, destroying their faith. Um, and it's not fair and balanced in our book. We talk about the fact that he doesn't always give you the other side, you know, right. so you just hear, his side of a story. And so part of our, our effort in our book was to give people the other side of a story so they can actually make up their mind. That's not, that's not integrity, right? If you deliberately withhold uh, what you know to be powerful counter arguments to you are, you just give people very selectively, you know, what, what supports your case. Yeah. yeah speaking of the book, I, I really uh, like the way it's, it's laid out here. You have, um, you know, and we talked about this when we were going through it, but you have kind of mm -hmm. the claims that are addressed and you kind of address them. And then at the end, you have these discussion questions. And then, as you mentioned earlier, you have the, the back of the book where everything is kind of summarized with this question and answer format. So what what uh, what, what were you trying to accomplish here with yeah. this kind of format? Well, we realized college students are busy <laughs> and, you know, sometimes just a matter of, 
he has some of those zingers or some of those one liners and, you know, they can be very devastating if somebody just, you know, it, it, it's, it creates doubt in the heart. And if, if they don't have a, a compelling answer to that, or they don't even realize there are compelling answers, uh, they may just swallow that, you know, just took line and sinker. And so we felt, well, we needed to, to have some sort of a tool where ideally people will read the whole book, right? But in case they don't, at least we give them a quick resource, you know, some sort of, a, you know, a primer where they kind of cliffs notes, right? Where they, they can look up, you know, one of the things that, 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 that he keeps repeating ad nauseum almost at some of those interviews and, you know, and then say, okay, yeah, there are answers. And I think part of it is he makes it look like that any intelligent person would agree with him. You know, right. and so uh, we got four PhDs among the three of us, right? And so uh, I remember my daughter, the one that enrolled there at you know at UNC. Uh, you know, she said, "So that uh, you wrote the book just basically to make the point that intelligent people can believe the Bible." Right. <laughs> and I said, yeah, essentially that's right. You yeah. know, because he almost makes it look like you have to be a simpleton or a country bumpkin, right. Uh, or super gullible. Um, in, in, in some of my teaching and I've, I've taught some of this in Sunday school classes or uh, at conferences, you know, I, I talk to people about a spectrum, you know, that you have on the one hand, you have extreme skepticism, and on the other hand, you have extreme naivete or, you know, people who believe everything. And he makes it always look like those are the only two options when, of course, there aren't. Right. I mean, on the one side, uh, from extreme skepticism, there would be doubt. Right. Doubt is different, I think, because doubt is open <laughs> To evidence, mm -hmm. but hardened skepticism basically raises the bar so high that, that, you know, there's never, you can never satisfy a hardened skeptic with evidence. And right. on the other side, you know, there's not only this, this uh, naive, naive gullibility that believes anything, there's also discerning engagement. And so mm -hmm. I think that is what we are trying to uh, uh, cultivate, especially with, with college students, you know, to say, yeah. You have questions. That's fine. You know, let's look at the issue, uh, not in a simplistic way, because when you find, uh, when you when we look at Ehrman's works closely, often he's the one who's very simplistic in the way he deals with a given issue. Uh, in many ways, he's just one of those historical critics, kind of like the, remember the Jesus seminar or, you know, uh, people who just already start out with this skepticism toward the resurrection or uh, you know, they published the book, the five gospels. And so they put in red what they thought Jesus said, and there's almost nothing is in red. You know? All the pebbles that we put into a fishbowl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we talked about that when we covered uh, Mitch Stokes' book, um, um, uh, How to Be an Atheist, how, how skeptics aren't skeptical enough, T taking their own claims and applying it to themselves and, and showing that, hey, uh, be skeptical, but then actually be skeptical. So uh, yeah. that that, yeah. Uh, that speaks well to, uh, to um, our continuing conversation. And as, far, yeah. as as a video editor as well, who, who cuts up our, our episodes and makes little short clips for people to kind of devour. I, I appreciate uh, how the book is laid out too, because it, it really helps. Uh, in fact, I, I had one, uh, <laughs> a, a, a tweet, uh, someone responded, uh, I think uh, uh, three weeks after I, I uh, we covered, uh, there's an example in your your book where Ehrman kind of claimed that uh, the, the, the return of Jesus in, uh, I believe, first and second uh, Thessalonians are contradictory, yeah. because one says, this will come quickly. And the other one says, this comes first. And there's this contradiction. I was like, well, mm -hmm. th that's what the, the video is about. Did you click on the link? No, I didn't click on the link. I just know that it's wrong. Like, what? I, just because something happens first doesn't mean that something also can't happen quickly. And it seems like it, it once yeah. you, once you break it down and kind of get past uh, the rhetoric and, and, and lay out yeah. what, what you've done in, in the book, um, you can actually um, see what the, the claim is and then see the responses. I think too, uh, yeah, and, you know, different people have different issues, you know, and then, so it's the kind of bo a book where yeah. people can jump around, they can go straight to whichever chapter, right. you know, they're most interested in. And then you just try to be clear in what you cover in a given chapter. Uh, and then, like you said, Tony, break it down into maybe a few specific uh, maybe claims Ehrman makes or, or questions he raises and then address it directly. We, we just felt like, okay, he doesn't invite us to his 
uh, you know, New Testament survey classes. <laughs> uh, but this is something we can put into the hands of hopefully, you know, many of his students mm-hmm. uh, where he he makes those claims. And so, you know, here are our answers, you know, for those who, who do want to know uh, the other side, because he doesn't even acknowledge that. There All is the issues he raises, <laughs> yeah. scholars have addressed, yeah. right. you know. I, I think that's one of the, the hindrances we have in, in the church today is is not being proud of our history. We have 2,000 years of church history, and uh, it, it seems like we have this idea that uh, starting from 1952 with the invention of, like, the the, the photocopier, that, that that's when true scholarship started. We, we didn't know anything before then. It was just people <laughs> that were, were attributing uh, lightning to God bowling type, type deal. But if, if you yeah. think about it, you know, uh, we, 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 we as a collective have been writing books against uh, uh, claims uh, against heresies and, and, and the like under persecution, under uh, political yeah. strife. I mean, we've had to deal with the Romans, the Muslims, the Roman Catholics, the, you know, the, 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 the rise and, and, and continuation of the Reformation. Uh, and then uh, the, the 20th century with, with uh, the, the academia coming, coming in becoming liberal. And then, uh, you know, if, if, if you think that you've, you've, you have something new. It's yeah. probably heresy. That's that's the joke. But it seems like if if you're writing something about the the, the Christian tradition, there's probably somebody within that span of two thousand years that have that has at least touched on it and talked about uh, you know uh, why there might be these differences in, in responding to it. Yeah, that's true. C.S. Lewis called that, uh, as you know, uh, chronological snobbery. You know <laughs> that. <laughs> Critical, critical scholars today, you know, say they know the truth better than those who are much closer to the time. And, and so, uh, you know, I deal with that quite a bit in my own writing that, you know, people find that, that just because an article is five or 10 years old, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. And, <laughs> and, and, and it, you know, somehow if an article was written like this year or last year, it, 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 it's more accurate, you know, and that's, that's demonstrably false. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's move on to, uh, to Walter Bauer. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of yeah. uh, curious about this. Uh, how, how did his theory become so uh, known to someone like Urban to, to kind of make it popular? Why is it, and why does it still hang around? Um, I, I, uh, we, we uh, outside the show uh, read uh, you're in uh, Michael J. Kruger, who I, I probably yeah. refer to you and Michael J. Kruger more than anything else. I did a, a clip show where I cut mm-hmm. uh, every time I said your guys' name. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, how, how often that happens. Uh, but uh, you, you did a uh, heresy of orthodoxy, which is, I yeah. think uh, just, just a brilliant book. I mean, it covers absolutely everything. And, and mm-hmm. the, 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 the thing that I like uh, with you and, and Kruger is that uh, you give the other side the respect that it deserves to even say, uh, Hey, you have a place at the table just as much as we do. We're going to kind of destroy your argument, but here, here's, yeah. wh- here's where the good things that you bring in to talk about. And, and then, um, um, mm-hmm. what, what, uh, uh, Michael J. Kruger has done with his other book of, of looking at the second century yeah. and looking how, how yeah. much strife yeah. there is Excellent within there. Book. Um, can, can you kind of talk about Bauer and kind yeah. of why he still remains? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. That's uh, Ehrman actually really uh, is, uh, is, is uh, he's aware of some of the weaknesses of that theory. I'll explain in a minute, but uh, so in, in, in the um, heresy of orthodoxy, we actually call it the Bauer Ehrman thesis because mm-hmm. uh, you know, Ehrman uh, has essentially uh, you know, bought into it uh, incredibly because he acknowledges that it's, it's very flawed. Um, and uh, I think we have our uh, kind of a sneaking suspicion why, but, but yeah, so this, this is something that uh, I, 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 contributed to the book naturally, you know, I German background. And, and so I was uh, just kind of fascinated. Walter Bauer is primarily actually known as a, uh, as a Greek scholar, right. For that famous Bauer lexicon. Uh, so this is almost like he was moonlighting when he wrote uh, the other book, right. <laughs> that, that the, uh, you know, the so-called Bauer thesis uh, is based on, uh, but essentially, as you know, uh, very simple uh, to explain. He says in the beginning, Christianity was diverse and only later uh, kind of coalesced in what uh, we today know as the Christian faith. Uh, in other words, in the first and early second century, Bauer claims there was no such thing as orthodoxy or right belief. There were only uh, multiple Christianities in the plural 
And as a result, you know, Ehrman wrote books, Lost Christianities, uh, The Lost Scriptures. You can already tell, right, by those book titles that, I mean, he's he's a complete power right. Um, and uh, and so he says those those Christianities in the plural could all equally stake the claim of being Christianity. There was no kind of standardization uh, in the first century. And I think you can see how that appeals to people today, because, you know, today is all about, you know, pluralism and and tolerance. And and so someone like Bart Ehrman, who teaches at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, you know, I've been to some of those parent orientations and, uh, you know, at uh, and student uh, welcomes at UNC. And, and clearly uh, that's a core value, diversity. <laughs> And, uh, and so he uses that to basically debunk the truthfulness of the Bible and its claims regarding Jesus as being the only way uh, and uh, Jesus being God. Um, so he, he calls the writers of Scripture proto-Orthodox, and he says there's only the Roman church later on that, that used its clout to decree what Christians were to believe, and, and then they branded everything else as heretical. Uh, so you and I, right? Basically, our forebears are really those those intolerant, uh, you know, people who who just brutally oppress the opposition. Um, it's really a rather cynical view because it says there's no such thing as absolute truth. All truth is relative, and and it's simply a matter of what the powerful impose on others. Mm. Uh, so I think that's why Bauer's theory still hangs around. It resonates with, and that's the subtitle of Heresy of Orthodoxy, with uh, uh, our contemporary culture's fascination with diversity and right. imposes it onto first century Christianity. Um, uh, and, you know, the, 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 the funny thing is that even though Bauer's book is called Heresy and Orthodoxy in earliest Christianity, um, it was first published in 1934, by the way, uh, for our listeners, but uh, not translated it into English in 1971. Mm-hmm. Um, he never studied the first century. So he calls his book Earliest Christianity. I mean, it's outright deceptive. The title is deceptive. Uh, he he. What he does is essentially study Christianity in the second century in four ma- major uh, cities, uh, such as, you know, Ephesus or, or Antioch. Uh, so his claim that he studied earliest Christianity is, is bogus. You know, it's patently false uh, because what we actually find when we do look at the first century evidence, which is what we do in our book, um, you know, both in, in truth in the culture of doubt and in heresy of orthodoxy, uh, what we find is there, were, there was a very strong definition of apostolic teaching and the gospel. And people who taught contrary to that were denounced by the first Christians like Paul or Peter in, in the strongest terms possible. Just think the first letter Paul wrote in our New Testament, Galatians chapter 1. Mm-hmm. Where he says, if anyone teaches a gospel other than the one I taught, let him be accursed. Yeah, um, it, it seems so, there where he's he's writing to to people who he he almost seems um, uh, 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 warning to to his audience of hey there there might be these letters that are floating around that I haven't written or authorized to write, and right. it seems like it's not like he got bonked on the head and is will suddenly become a, a gnostic. It seems like he's saying, listen, if it, this comes from you know, Paul, the apostle, and it says, you know, uh, uh, Jesus uh, didn't have a bodily form, throw that out. That's, that's anathema. It's, it's damned heresy. Uh, It seems like even what you're talking about, Galatians one is, is uh, uh, shedding an important light on the, the, uh, the written aspect of, of our, our tradition. And, and this idea of, uh, oh, it was only an oral tradition that was later passed on. Uh, it, It seems uh, we have an earlier attestation of of evidence for the the, the importance of the written uh, uh, gospel aspect. Yeah, yeah, and so the dates, you know, when you look at um, at Galatians, we're talking about the early fifties AD. Yeah. You know, so that's a lot earlier than those those Gnostic writings. Certainly, <laughs> middle of the first century. You think of Acts two forty two. The early church was devoted. Very strong work, devoted to the apostles' teaching. Again, we're talking about literally, right, 
I mean, you know, weeks after the uh, the resurrection, uh, First Corinthians, you know, the the, the famous uh, you know articulation of the gospel there in First Corinthians uh, fifteen, and uh, is is also written in the mid fifties. And so we're talking about very, very early on, uh, we find, uh, the church completely rallying around, uh, the gospel. And the reason for that, I think is in part because it is basically just, it's already taught in the old Testament in, in, in Romans one, Paul says it's the gospel of God who was promised beforehand in the law and the prophets. This is not even a new Testament innovation. Uh, it's basically a, an application of Old Testament teaching, uh, you know, in light of the fact that Jesus has now come, the Messiah has now come. And when you look at the Gnostic writings, there's not a reference to the Old Testament. Gnostics had no use for the Old Testament whatsoever. And so that's how you can immediately tell if your writing is Christian or Gnostic, you know, is is there a, a, a building on on the Old Testament? And so, so you think that uh, Bauer then uh, gets his I, clearly, as you've uh, demonstrated here, he he didn't look in the earliest of Christianity in the first. Yeah, century. that's, that's a great thing. point, Tony. He yeah. just didn't look early enough, inexplicably. Right, as a scholar, would you not want to get to the root of the issue? And right. clearly, Christianity started in the 30s A.D. Right. Why not look there? Um, I think you know. He was more of a, maybe a little bit more of a, of an academic scholar that just did that study and which he thought would be interesting to, to, to go to those cities and to see, hey, uh, were there more Christians or were there more heretics? But even that already presupposes that, you know, you know, how to distinguish between the two. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, like you said, I think that that is his problem from a, scholarly perspective. As a result, uh, Tony, there have been some devastating critiques of Bauer. So we're not the first ones to critique. Fortunately, we could build on the work of others. Yeah. You know, the amazing thing is, Patrick, as you mentioned, that somehow that Bauer thesis still sticks around, even though it's been just soundly refuted uh, as, you know, being really, uh, um, you know, flawed to the point of being fatally flawed. I think we when we read uh, Heresy of Orthodoxy, I blamed it on the Nazis because uh, we, we couldn't get it over here and translate it and, and respond to it quick enough so that it would die a natural death of, of just being an, a, a, an odd placeholder. You know, someone's going to yeah. quote it in, in their in their uh, in, in their dissertation, and it, it'll just be so that they have another uh, point in the yeah. dissertation. Now, yeah, now exactly. we have popular writings that we have to uh, to work around. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. so kind of transitioning to, to, um, going towards the end of our time here, um, yeah. kind of the, the forge aspect of the new Testament documents, this seems to be like a, a, yeah. a, a big, a big uh, selling point even today. Do you see, um, the study going forward more, or is it just, we're constantly having to respond to the critic where it's, it almost seems like, uh, this mm -hmm. hyper skepticism of, well, there was no Jesus, uh, no apostles. So that Christianity just kind of appears somehow within the, the confines yeah. of history that, or it kind of develops out of Hellenism or, or, or I, 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 I honestly don't know yeah. how you can be that, that level of skeptic. But um, as far as, as, as you were saying, our, our best evidence is the new Testament documents um, in yeah. the book and, and in our interview here, uh, do you, do you see more, more work needing to be done? Or are there, are there gaps in our, mm. our knowledge that will uh, break, break the, the, the bonds, yeah. if you will? Well, Patrick, I'm really glad you raised that question because it's it's an important question. What you might call introductory matters, and and you know we uh, colleagues of mine and I wrote a like 1,200 page book, uh, the Cradle Across the Crown, where we deal with that. You know, for every one of the 27 books of the New Testament, so because we think it is so important. Anytime you study a book, right, in in a small group or a church, essentially you always have to ask yourself some of those basic questions. You know, who wrote the book, to whom, when, where, and why. And I think the problem is that during the Enlightenment period, it became fashionable, almost required to challenge long held views uh, uh, taught by the institutional church. So there's this, uh, this almost like anti-tradition bias that the enlightenment bequeathed on scholarship. And, you know, in some cases, uh, this was good uh, in that it, 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 it helped the reformers recover uh, the gospel of justification 
uh, you know, through faith by grace. Yeah. Uh, but in many other cases, it was, it was bad because people uh, felt compelled to overturn long-held beliefs, even when they're based on solid early evidence. Yeah. Uh, such so as the authorship of our New back Testament to the sources, writings. But other people just threw everything out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, an overreaction, I mean, a massive overreaction If the, to the point of if the church has believed something and taught something, it must be false. You know, uh, just kind of like a rebellious teenager, right? I mean, <laughs> parents, you know, uh, can't do anything right. Uh, so unfortunately today, I think there's a great divide between believing uh, scholars and, and critical or even skeptical scholars when it comes to authorship issues and uh, introductory matters. Uh, because critical scholars typically have a very strong aversion toward like the titles of the Gospels, for example, uh, and the explicit attribution of the New Testament letters uh, uh, to Paul, to Peter. And also remember, they don't believe in biblical inerrancy or inspiration. You know, they're non-confessional. They're basically uh, agnostic or, or really have a low view of scripture, essentially. Uh, but I think one thing that strikes me again and again, when you actually look at it historically, history is usually not on their side. And I think that's very important uh, because Bart Ehrman, he presents himself as a historian. Mm-hmm. He kind of taking the, the high road, right? And so then anybody who disagrees with him, they're just not as good a historian as he is. Mm-hmm. And so I enjoy sometimes taking him on, on the point of history. I'm saying, really? Okay. So the, uh, uh, you know, some of those authorship issues are, uh, you know, they don't have sufficient historical attestation. What about the early canonical lists? Uh, you know, uh, the Muratorian canon dates to about 180. Mm-hmm. Uh, Irenaeus writes in, in the, the 180s as well. Well, they only acknowledge four Gospels, the ones we have, right? So that's a lot sooner than the fourth century um, and none of those Gnostic Gospels are ever included in any cano- uh, early canonical list. Um, so you have to ask yourself, why would people want, I always like to ask myself the question, why would want people to dispute the New Testament claims regarding authorship so badly in the first place? You know, what is the agenda that drives them? They make it look like we have an agenda, right? To just kind of like defend the Bible, but they have an agenda as well. And I think in some cases, it's just outright skepticism, not just toward the Bible, but, but toward Christianity and and even, you know, toward God himself. So uh, Bart Ehrman, I think maybe his, one of his more recent books, he claims that many of the New Testament documents were forged. Again, why does he do that? It's obvious, right? To discredit them. Uh, in other cases, it may be specific teachings in certain writings that people try to set aside because they're inconvenient uh, or offensive to them. Uh, for example, Paul's teaching on the role of women in the church in first Timothy two. So, you know, by saying that first Timothy is late and forged, uh, you can marginalize uh, those kinds of teachings and those people can claim they lack authority and don't need to be obeyed. Uh, so you see, there's often an agenda and ideology behind why scholars affirm pseudonymity or claim that the New Testament writings are forged. Is, is, is there a book that you can uh, uh, suggest of, of covering the topic of, of the role of women in the church? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, th- this is a 25 year project where Tom Schreiner and I have in three subsequent editions, about 10 years apart, uh, written a book, women in the church on, uh, on first Timothy two. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the exegesis is clear. Paul meant what he said and said what he meant, you know, and we go in that book, go through it, you know, one word at a time and say, I really means I, and not permitting really does mean not permitting and, <laughs> and so forth. But it's, 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 it's really uh, been very helpful for the church, even universally in Australia and in the UK and in Germany, uh, you know, because often uh, people are questioning uh, the exegesis of, of, of first Timothy two in an effort to, again, like we said, to marginalize that teaching uh, because they find it culturally, you know, unpalatable and then they just, they simply don't want it in the Bible. Yeah. So sometime soon we'll, we'll probably see missionaries coming from China to evangelize the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
So, so let's let's kind of switch gears a little bit more, and as we taper down here, let's. So, our you know our channel is about um, apologetics, right? And so, yeah. And this book obviously is a book on apologetics. I mean, you're taking on you know questions yeah. about you know why Christianity is wrong, basically, right? And uh, so, yeah. where 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 do you see apologetics heading? You know, I. Uh, so here's mm-hmm. a, you know, your book is yeah. mainly about the, the, the documents and that sort of thing. Uh, there's also, mm-hmm. you know, evidences, there's all kinds of, you know, directions, I guess. Uh, any, any thoughts yeah. or ideas? Yeah. And again, I, I feel like, you know, for me, apologetics is, is not my only topic or even my main topic. And then even though I, I have a keen interest, obviously, as a Christian, uh, you know, defending the faith, uh, not even as a scholar, even as I mentioned, as a as a as a believer, as a, as a, as a parent. Um, but, you know, just kind of like uh, my own personal outlook on, on, on where apologetics may be headed, I you know, I actually don't believe you can reason someone into the kingdom. I don't know. You might agree or disagree, but <laughs> uh, so I think apologetics is of some value, but it's of limited value. I mean, it's valuable, but you know, there are limitations as well. I feel like uh, God is to draw a person and even faith in Christ is ultimately a gift from God as, as Paul, you know, affirms in Ephesians two, eight and nine. But but having said that, and I felt I, I just wanted to preface my remarks yeah, with it. That's very important. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one hopeful sign that I see is there's a, a, a branch of biblical apologetics that is developing, that is trying to do apologetics, you know, from a biblical standpoint, and that's that's less abstract and uh, you know, just merely philosophical in nature. I think such an approach is epitomized in the work of scholars such as uh, Josh, Josh Shatra, our, our co-author, uh, thinking of his recent book, Apologetics uh, at the Cross, yeah. or his m- more recent work, Telling a Better Story. He's still a good friend. We we uh, live in the same area. We recently uh, talked just, I mean, I wish we could have had him be here with me because we were talking about, so where do you think this thing is going? Where, I mean, where, if you want to hook us up with an interview, we'll, we'll gladly interview him. <laughs> sure, that, that'd sure. Be, that'd where do you awesome. think apologetics is headed? You know, because he's the one, even more than me, who's currently really doing a lot of work on it. Uh, I think we've already moved away quite a bit from previous generations of apologists, uh, you know, which is a well, I mean, it's a book that served us well in previous generations, like uh, evidence that demands a verdict. But, Mm -hmm. but I think books like that are based on the assumption that all we have to do is set forth the evidence, like for Christianity or for the empty tomb and people are going to believe. But the problem with that approach, I think, is that today, many people, they're not going to be convinced, even if we set forth all the evidence, they have subjective reasons why they're resistant. And I think that's why we need to engage people on the level of their own life story and experience and show that show them Jesus is relevant to their lives. Uh, you know, nobody sat me down and say, you know, when I was an unbeliever, you know, let me give you all the evidence for the the empty tomb, you know, and I said, okay, I believe now, right? (laughs) It's just not that simple. I think we need to tell them the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus, of the early Christians. We need to show them that it's a compelling story of love, of truth. Uh, Need to captivate them with that story as they struggle with sin, uh, struggle to make sense of their lives. Um, And so this is really, I think, the time for a new kind of apologetics. And I feel like younger scholars like, like Josh, uh, I think uh, have done a great job in, in kind of getting us into the 21st century, as far as apologetics is concerned. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in, in our uh, concluding question here, um, you, uh, you are a founder of uh, biblical foundations with your wife and it's uh, it's it says it's an organization devoted to encouraging a return to the biblical foundations in the home, the church and society. Uh, yeah. that, that seems like a, a big project to undertake. Can you t- talk a little bit more about your organization there? Thank you. So that's a very personal thing. Uh, I think it started with my book, God, Marriage, and Family. Uh, I think it was originally written in 2004. Um, 
And um, we, we came to realize that, you know, people coming to seminary, they, they no longer, we can no longer assume that they come from a wholesome family. They have good role models in the home and they can then, uh, you know, pastor a church and, 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 and teach well uh, and live well uh, what, what God says in scripture with regard to the role of men and women. Uh, and so uh, we initially wrote that book for, as a required course text for our classes on, on marriage and the family uh, that every everybody preparing for the pastorate was required to, to read. And, and uh, you know, there's books on, on different aspects. There's books on divorce, there's books on homosexuality and, and, and then singleness and so forth. But we wanted to have one book that, that covers that whole range of, of topics related to uh, marriage and the family. So that's what, what started. We did a second edition of that book in 2010. And then uh, my wife and I, uh, wanted to share a biblical theology of manhood and womanhood. And so in 2014, we wrote a book, uh, God's Design for Man and Woman. Uh, that's now a book that uh, both of us often use in our teaching. We we teach classes on that. And I think our students often tell us how compelling they find it when we lead them, you know, through. And they show that scripture is very consistent. It's very coherent. Uh, Jesus and Paul are not in conflict. Uh, you know, Paul and Jesus in the Old Testament are not in conflict. Uh, there's some development, but but more often than not, Jesus and Paul go right back to Genesis 1 through 3. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's just beautiful to see. And so more recently then, uh, my wife and I have written uh, a few books on, on parenting as well, because we feel like we've kind of almost graduated from parenting. Our <laughs> oldest is uh, 19 now, and uh, he's... He's at UNC, uh, you know, a, a, a rising sophomore. And so the battle is not over yet. Uh, so uh, we but, continue but you to, just, you know, just pull a book, a good book off your shelf to, to give to him because you've answered all his questions. <laughs> well, he, 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 he told me uh, as he left uh, this afternoon that he's praying for me and for the podcast. And, and he said, uh, no worries. I have truth matters in my backpack right now. <laughs> no. that's a, a raging endorsement. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's what you put on your next cover. <laughs> Well, Dr. Kosberger, I, 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 I greatly appreciate yeah, you coming on our show. Really I really do. I, really I, I have to just send, send you the, the request for to come on. And I, I was like, you know, the worst you can say is is no or or delete it. And oh, uh, happy you, to, you, you came happy on. Happy to join you. And, and, keep, and uh, keep up the good work. I, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Love what I've seen of your show. Wonderful. Well, I I think that's a raging endorsement right there for, for our show. Mm -hmm. I'm putting it on the cover. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for your work. Uh, like I said, uh, I, I, I hold most of your books and uh, we'll, we'll put all the books that we talked about in the links uh, below or on, on um, uh, which, whichever um, episode number this comes out so that people have a good swath of, of, of your writings. But uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're awesome. Thank you.